You guys may be seated. Well, I mean, finish what you're doing. You know, you like each other and all that. Thank you for being here. My name's Tim. I get to be one of the pastors here, and I'm excited just to have the opportunity to share some of God's word with you and just uh, walk through. Uh, we've been in the book of 1 Peter, so that's where we'll be today. 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, in Better Ahead has been the name of our series. And Better Ahead is like those, those hopeful words that no matter what's happening now, there's better coming. How many of you, by show of hands, this is the, the part of the, the, the message where we try to get everybody on the same page, but how many of you would agree with the statement that you're either coming out of a storm, you're in the middle of a storm, or you know that there's a storm that's probably coming. Is that true of anybody, everybody? You've lived long. If you haven't been, if you haven't lived very long, like if you're among us and you're one of our students or one of our kids, like we're glad you're here and we hope that this wasn't discouraging to you. Uh, be blessed and well-fed. That's, it's just the truth, right? Like life just is hard. There's no way to predict how difficult it will be. There's, there's no way to, to, to see it all coming. So today, uh, I wanted to be able to come and deliver some words of wisdom. As a pastor, I've I've sat with people who are going through hard times and I've tried to my best like muster up and come up with something to like encourage them or help them. And I just be real honest with you, I'm not very good at that. That's just not something that I, I don't feel very certain that I can say anything that's really gonna be of, of great value or great encouragement to you. I've been through those hard times and people have tried to come and say things to me that have tried to encourage me and tried to help me. And I gotta be honest, I don't know that they were very good at that. Like, I don't know that that was their gift either. And so today, the reason I bring all that up is because the text that we're looking at actually is helpful. Like the things we're gonna to discover today, they're like the gold that was hidden at the bottom of the, of the mine. Like this is really helpful. First, in this letter, First Peter, Peter actually says some things about going through the hard times that matter and that are important. So if you have your copy of God's word, we're gonna be in First Peter chapter one, starting in verse six. It will be on the screen otherwise, but here's how he gets into this idea of trials and, and hardship. He says in verse six, he says, in this you rejoice. Just stop right there. And for those of you who know that I grew up Southern Baptist, you already know you're in trouble when we get to word four and we've stopped. But it says, in this you rejoice. In what do we rejoice? Well, this is important because this sets the stage. This is like the foundation for everything that he's gonna say over the next several verses. Like, here's, this is important. So if you got your copy of the word, like you wanna circle, rejoice. Because like if you don't get this part, like the rest of it is not gonna make any sense. You're just, it's gonna sound trite and it's gonna sound cliche. So you gotta get this part. In this you rejoice. Well, what do we rejoice in? Well, as Pastor Mike pointed out last week through verses three through five in this first chapter of Peter, Peter is explaining to his readers, explaining to us about this eternal inheritance that God has set for us. He says that there were three things last week. He said that, that God has done some things for us. He has secured for us a hope that is alive. He has said that we have an eternal inheritance. And then he says that we, ha we have a secure and guarded final victory. Does anybody remember that? Of course you don't. No, listen, that's what Mike said, okay? So you gotta go back. If you missed that message or you couldn't recite those things, it's available on our website or YouTube. It's out there, go find it. If you missed it, check it out. But this is the inheritance that Peter says, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Peter is referring to this as, this is what we rejoice in. His first audience would have rejoiced in the truth, and so should you and I. That God in his mercy and love chose out of his goodness to rescue from sin and death his very enemies. And to do so, he sent his only son, Jesus, into the world to live a perfect and sinless life, to die a death he did not deserve, but that you and I have earned over and over again to pay the penalty of sin on our behalf. Peter says in verse three, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, resulting in the salvation of all who believe, confess, and commit their lives to God. As Peter said to his first audience, I say to you this morning, in this you should rejoice. Amen, church. Amen. Let's go on. He says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. 
So after a reminder to rejoice, Peter says that trials are going to come, but he qualifies the entrance of trials into the topic by some pre-qualifying statements, some statements, two little phrases there that are very, very important to us. He says that they are for a little while, if necessary. I gotta be honest with you though. You may have already picked this up yourself. For a little while is a terrible pre-qualifier for those of us who like to work within precision. You know, for a little while. It's kind of like when I tell my wife hates this, by the way. So when you see her later, you can just, God bless you, lady. Um, I'll say to my wife, something happened the other day. The other day could be yesterday. The other day could have been last Sunday. The other day could have been six years ago. The other day could be, I don't really remember when, but I know it happened on a day, not this day, on the other day. Anybody with me? It is not a great pre-qualifier. A little while doesn't really help us in preparation for the trial. A little while. What does that even mean? Because how long is a little while gets determined by how long a while we might be talking about. So if we knew how long the while was, we might be able to conceive what a little bit of it is, but if we don't have that reference, then a little while really doesn't qualify anything for us. I think about the mayflies. Were any of you, so it's a safe place, but were any of you like bug nerds when you were a kid? Any bug nerds? Come on, put your hands up high. It's okay, be proud. I am a nerd. I was never a bug nerd. I was just, it just never, and I'm not, I was a book nerd, not a, not a bug nerd, and sometimes you're both. And I'm not saying one nerd is better than another nerd. Calm down. Nerds unite. I was never a bug nerd, but I do think that the mayfly is an important illustration for us here today because the entire lifespan of a mayfly is 24 hours. So 24 hours is all that they will live. So if Mr. Mayfly is flying through the air and a strong gust of wind comes and knocks him off course for, say, four and a half, five and a half seconds, he has just had his life disrupted for a little while. But for you and I, it's not even worth mentioning. See, it has a lot to do with how long a while we might be talking about when we talk about qualifying trials through a little while. Not only that, not only is it how long we're talking about, but also what qualifies a little while and is helpful is what's happening within that little while. Like the time being spent might be you know, definite, but like what is happening within that time might determine to us how long it feels. For example, um, my wife and I, for our 10th wedding anniversary, we went to Disney World, just the two of us. We didn't take any kids. We just went and it was great, but we could only stay for like a day in each park. So we like went to the Magic Kingdom for one whole day. We could just be there for a little while. And if you're there and you don't have any kids and it's like in the fall and the weather's great, it feels like a flash because by the time you get to all of the rides and you see all the shows and you eat all the food, it's time for fireworks. Like it just goes by in a flash. Now, take that same amount of time, but take your children who don't handle a change to nap schedule very well, and that little while could take forever because it looks a little bit more like this. And you're like, it's the same amount of time, but it would just seem like it took forever. Come on, parents, say amen. It's just like, this is awful. And so when Peter comes to talking about trials and he says, hey, listen, it's going to happen for a little while. We got to have a reference of how long the whole while is so that we can get a picture of what a little bit of it might be. And then what's going to happen within that time is also going to determine, you know, how long it feels. Well, Peter is using this reference are using this phrase in reference to the internal inheritance that he's already aforementioned. So he's talking about this eternal inheritance, and then he says a little while. Pastor Mike touched on this last week, but you and I and everyone you know are going to live a long time beyond this existence. That our life exists here on the earth and then into eternity. Oh, I have a prop. This is what we call a smooth transition to illustration. Let's pretend that this rope, by the way, this is a big rope. It came from the CrossFit gym that I work out in because I felt obligated to tell you that I CrossFit. <laughs> now you know. Um, <clears throat> let's assume that this rope 
runs down off the platform and down the aisleway here and then out back there, the doors that aren't doors anymore. And then it goes in to the prayer garden and out to the parking lot. And then it runs all the way down Emerson Avenue. Are you still with me? It goes all the way down Emerson Avenue. It gets on 77. It heads all the way past Ravenswood, past Ripley. All the, we're going to Charleston. You with me? We're going all the way to Charleston with this rope. And this rope represents our entire lives, both here on earth and in eternity. And I know some of you already know that this is not a perfect illustration because eternity has no end. And I know, but it's a good illustration. So just stay with me. And so it goes all the way down to Charleston, West Virginia. But when you get there, we don't stop because this rope's going all the way to Charleston, South Carolina. Are you with me? Okay. <clears throat> if that's this rope all the way from here to Charleston, South Carolina, this part with the tape on it is how long we will spend on earth. Just this much. Just this part. And Peter says, it might be necessary for you to face trials for a little while, which means even if your life is 90 or 100 years long and every day is a trial, in light of the whole rope, it's just a little while. It's just for a little while. He's giving us a reference for the little while. <clears throat> and here's what's, here's what's interesting about the little while. Peter's not the only one who talks in these terms. If we go over to James chapter four, we hear from the brother of Jesus who said this, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. He's pointing to the idea that there is the section of our existence that is here and now on this planet and then there is the rest of it. And even if every day of this existence is a trial and a struggle, he says, hold on, because it's just for a little while. He then goes on and he says, if necessary. Here Peter says that while we rejoice in the inheritance that is to come, we will for a little while face some trials, but that's actually very, very good news if they are necessary. That's an interesting word, necessary. Because here's the real trial with trials. When we're in the midst of a hardship, when we're in the midst of a trial, when we're in the midst of a struggle, doesn't it, come on, we'll be honest this morning, doesn't it sometimes, doesn't it just feel meaningless? It kind of feels hopeless because it's not of any value to anything. But Peter says that the trial that you're facing is necessary. See, necessity means meaning. Write this down. If it's necessary, it's not meaningless. Come on, church. If it's necessary, it's not meaningless. Necessity is a term of purpose. The things, are going, the things that you're going through, they're not meaningless, that it has not become hopeless, that it isn't frivolous, that it isn't without purpose, that it actually serves you, that it is necessary. Without its necessity, trials and tribulation and hardships, things can get real dark real quick, can't they? If we don't hold on to the necessity of what we're going through, it can seem very, very meaningless and things can get very, very bleak. In fact, Peter addresses this right away because he uses an illustration himself. Like pastors, we like to illustrate things from the text, but Peter actually writes the illustration for us. He says this, he says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you may be grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, and here's his illustration, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says that this trial that you're facing, that it is similar to the refining process of gold. Peter's understanding in biblical times of refining gold was that the gold was heated up to a high temperature, probably pretty unpleasant for the gold. And as it was heated, what would happen was everything that was in the gold that wasn't gold would rise to the top. It would bubble up and then it would be scraped off. And as a result, you would get a purer gold. The gold would be more gold. It would be more trustworthy to actually be gold. And as a result, it would be worth more. It would be more valuable. That refined gold is more valuable than unrefined gold. 
Peter says, this is what it's like to have a Christian faith. This is what it's like for you and I in the midst of trials, that when we go through a hardship, we're being squeezed and heated up and what's impure within us, what is lacking in our faith, bubbles to the top. It comes out of us to be seen and more easily dealt with. Peter says that the result of these trials will, quote, result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That these trials, they purify us, they test our faith, that we would be able to give more glory and more praise and more honor to God in the day of Jesus' re- return or in our, with our presence before him, that we would be able to give more honor to him, more praise, and then also that we would feel the full vindication of the faith that we have held so tightly to. We get to say, I made it, it was worth it, it was tough, I wasn't sure I was gonna get here, but I made it. It felt like it took forever, but for his glory, it was worth it. One more thought here on what Peter's talking about, if necessary, when facing trials. There are some within the Christian tradition who have misunderstood or misinterpreted Paul's words here. And what they have taken this to mean is in a twisted fashion that unless you are suffering, you must not be being faithful. And so what happens as a result is folks want, well-intended folks perhaps, they go looking for a fight. They go looking to make people upset with their faith because they believe within them that if they are not facing some persecution, that they must not be being faithful to God. I'll give you an example. When I was the student pastor here, we took our students to Winter Jam, which is a big Christian concert in Charleston. Okay, it's this big, I mean, like it's all day or something like that. I don't, I don't, I've never paid attention. <clears throat> we take the big bus load of kids, we take them up there. And like, you know, I'm sure the concerts were great, but when you're a youth pastor, you're just trying to keep all the puppies in the box. That's really... You're just trying to like stay in line, let's go. You know, it's downtown, it's dark. We're trying to get across streets. You know, you gotta park the bus somewhere weird. So anyway, we're walking in and we got this group. We're walking by and I can see like across the street and down a little bit, there's a guy with a, a, one of those little mini megaphones, you know what I'm talking about? And I can't quite make out what he's saying, but he's not, he's not happy. I can tell just by the body language that he's not selling lemonade. And so... We get down there closer, and as we're walking past him, this is what happened, it's just what happened, I'm just telling you a story. The guy takes the little mini megaphone and he puts it in the ear of one of the girls in our group. And he says something to the effect of like, your youth pastor and all his underlings are leading you to hell or something, I don't know, nonsense. Now here's what happened. (laughs) I'm just telling you what happened. I didn't, I'm not, good, bad, just, just what happened. I went to get in between him and our student. And before I could get there, one of our volunteers who uh, was very involved at the time, who will remain nameless, but if you're watching, you know who you are. He steps between this girl and bullhorn guy and he just stares him right in the eyes and he says, don't talk to her. And the guy tried to move around him and he just moved with him. And the guy got real quiet and real silent until all of our group went by and then our volunteer followed us on through. Now here's probably what happened. Megaphone man went back to his friends and were like, I faced persecution. They hated us. They didn't wanna hear what we had to say. I was, you know what the reason they treated me that way was I was just telling the truth. No, listen, man, no, we didn't dislike you because you were telling the truth. We disliked you because you were being a jerk. I mean, let's be real. You went looking for a fight and the audience you chose to fight with were like teenagers going to see Stephen Curtis Chapman. Like probably not gonna get punched back a lot. Like in that environment, not a great, you know? And you say, well, where does that come from? Where does that desire for that type of conflict and that to go pick that fight, where does that come from? Well, it comes from a lot of places, but in a lot of ways, I think it comes from a misunderstanding that somehow we have to be out there in the middle of some type of debate or fight. And like, if we're not contending for the faith and making people dislike us, somehow we're not suffering enough for God to really be pleased with us. But that's not what Peter says at all. What Peter says here isn't some empty platitude and it's not permission to be mean to people. It's actually more powerful than that. His his words actually are very pointed. 
He doesn't say that all, you know, all trials are gonna be helpful or all trials are gonna be good. He doesn't say that you should get out there and please God by being picked on. No, what he says is what you are facing is necessary. You, specifically. The trial that you are facing is necessary. Whatever, for those of you in the room right now and you're going through a tough time, you're facing a trial, you're going through a hardship, you're feeling pressed on every side. What you are facing right now, Peter says, is necessary. He also says that it comes in different flavors as various trials. Peter says that not all of the trials that he's talking about are exactly the same. He says, You're gonna rejoice though for now for a little while, if necessary, you will be grieved by various trials. That you're gonna be grieved by various trials, different types of trials, different types of challenges, different types of of trouble. The term various trials is actually translated many colors. That's the word he uses. It's found in in Greek literature. It's all different types of colors. Like, Like it's just a variety. Like someone might look at a bird in his day and say that the bird had various colored feathers. Some, some tri- he says, this is how we describe the trials. Some of the trials are really, really big and some of the trials are really, really small. There were some specific things, right? That the people that he was initially writing to that were in the dispersion, that's what, how, the, how the book opens, right? In 1 Peter 1, he says, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion, Right? Well, they've, they've, they're living somewhere outside of their hometown. They, they've been scattered. They've been spread out. He's like, there's some things you're facing, but they're living in different areas. They're living in different communities. They're living in different places. And the things they're facing, while difficult, while a struggle, they vary. They're, they're like, because maybe you're here today and you're like, well, what I'm going through really doesn't, this doesn't apply to me. My trial isn't this trial. My trial isn't noble enough. My trial isn't big enough. No, he says all, all struggles, all trials get included. This letter from from Peter is written and delivered to the churches somewhere between uh, 62 and 63 AD. Okay, so 62, 63, somewhere in there, because, you know, by the time you write and you get it distributed, you get it out there, a long time passes. Well, uh, you know, not not too long later, in 64, Rome is going to burn to the ground. A fire is going to break out in the city of Rome, and 70% of the city is going to be destroyed. Lots and lots of people are going to die. And so what happens is the emperor, a man named Nero, has to come up with an explanation as to what happened. Now, most historians agree today that a fire was probably inevitable, that Rome at that time was so, pop, so densely populated, people living on top of each other, and for all of the purposes that they used open flame, a fire was probably going to break out at some point no matter what. But Nero needed to give answers He needed to deliver to the people some certainty as to what had caused the fire so that he could figure out how to never have a fire like this again. And so Nero blames the Christians for the fire. Now, Nero didn't come up with that out of the air. What did he do? He was listening to the popular sentiment already. People were already frustrated with Christians. Christians within this dispersion and within Rome were already facing financial hardship. They were already facing exclusion. They were also already facing discrimination, right? They were also face, already facing you know, uh, social pressure to change, harassment. They were being excluded from jobs and work. And so Peter says, all of these shades, varieties, sizes, degrees, styles, all of that is the trials that I'm talking about. This is the challenge when preaching a text like this. Because for us in a big room like this sitting in rows, you may be facing a trial that is seemingly small in your opinion. And you may be tempted to just check out and assume that this message is for someone else because your trial isn't seeming very great. But others of you, you may be facing a trial that's so large, you can't see through it or around it or to the other side of it. And everything that Peter says just sounds cliche and trite and unimportant. And so Peter tries to bring resolution by saying all trials. And in our context, I'll be honest with you, a discussion at a connect group about our trials would probably be more effective for us. 
be an opportunity for us to sit in a circle and to see each other's faces, to be able to lean in and understand the compassion, and the concern that we have for one another, that we'd be able to pray for one another and build one another up as we face various trials. Because you might be looking at something right now that is earth shattering and life shaking, or you may be looking at something that years from now you may look back and say, well, that was fairly minor. We may even classify it as a first world problem. But Peter says it's all trial. It's all included. And God uses all of it. It because it's all necessary. If it's necessary, all trials are meaningful. All trials. And Peter understood the different types of trials that we would face. Peter, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, didn't have to have the experience that he had to write this, but he did have the experience. For those of you who are familiar with Peter, you know that he and his wife lived with his mother in law. That was a trial. I'm kidding. I love my mother-in-law. But in Matthew chapter eight, we know that Peter's mother-in-law fell very, very sick to the point of being incapacitated. She couldn't get out of bed. Jesus heals her, but between the time that she got sick and the time that Jesus heals her, think about what Peter must have been experiencing. He didn't do anything to make her sick and he was helpless to make her better. He was facing a trial. Peter also knew what it was like, like to face trials in his business. Do you remember Luke 5? We have this miracle of this great catch that Jesus brings about them. But think about what precedes that. Peter, a professional fisherman, fishes all night. He knows what he's doing. It's his livelihood. It's how he puts food on the table for his wife and his, 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 his uh, sick mother-in-law. And he catches nothing. He feels like a failure probably even has like all of those thoughts that pop up in our heads when our jobs aren't going the way that they're supposed to. We start wondering if we're worthy, if we're good enough, if we should pack it all in and do something else. He understood what that trial was like. There's also trials that we face because we are following Jesus. And Peter knew what those were like too. Unlike the megaphone man, Peter actually knew what it was like to stare a trial in the face because of his commitment to Jesus. Remember the last time we were together, we talked about that Peter was in the boat with the disciples during the storm. The boat was sinking. They were gonna drown. And Jesus comes walking to them on the water and Peter in his boldness gets out of the boat and walks on the water with Jesus. But then what happens? He begins to sink in the storm. He begins to drown. I would say drowning is a trial. Some of us feel like we're drowning, but he was there because he was following Jesus. Or how about in Luke 22, when Jesus is on his way to the cross and a young girl confronts Peter and says, aren't you one of Jesus's disciples? And he is so emphatically denying even knowing Jesus, he's swearing about it. He's facing a trial because of his faithfulness to Jesus. Following Jesus didn't make everything okay. It didn't make everything better for Peter. Peter says that everyone in every trial, he says, pay attention, lean in. That thing that you're facing, it's necessary and it is producing within you not just the faith that you need, but the faith that you want. These trials are growing us with, within us a faith that is beyond anything that Peter would have known firsthand. Peter begins to speak out of his experience here when we drop down below uh, verse, into verse eight. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. He says, you didn't see him, but you love him and you don't see him now, but you believe in him. Peter never had to do that. Peter was with Jesus when he was here on the earth. Peter experienced hearing Jesus's voice firsthand. Peter saw the miracles. Peter saw everything that Jesus did. And here's what he says. When we endure these trials, they are growing inside of us a faith that allows you to believe and follow Jesus as if you were right there with us. This isn't just a faith that you need. It's the faith that I want. I want to follow Jesus as if I was there when he was here. Amen. It's meaningful. 
then trials are good for us. That's what he says. He says that though you've not seen him, that you've loved him, and though you do not see him now, you believe in him. He says there's a result to this faith that you not only need, but you want. He says it is the salvation of your souls. I know we've talked about this before, but it bears mentioning again, God does not make bad things good. It's not what he does. He does not look into our trial and see a bad thing happening to us and then look down wrongly and call it good. He's unable to do that. He does, not, he does however, take what is bad. He does take what is challenging and he overrules it. He, he takes what's bad and overrules the destructive power that it has in our life and he redeems it for our good. And it's important that we understand that when we read Romans 8, 28, because Paul says, for we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are, who are called according to his purpose. So God doesn't look down and see a bad thing. If a bad thing is happening to you, if a bad thing has happened to you, he doesn't just look down and, and just flippantly call a bad thing a good thing. That's not what he does, it's a bad thing. Your heart's broken over it and so is his. He doesn't make a bad thing a good thing, but here's what he does do. He takes, the, he takes what bad destruction was coming into your life and through the trial overrules it for our good. What's important for us is that we define that good. Before we leave, if we're gonna understand Peter's words, we have to understand what he means. We have to understand what Paul means here in eight, Romans 8, 28, what the good is. Good is defined as making us more like Jesus more and more often. That's what's good. That the trial is designed to make me look more and more like Jesus more and more often. And that as a result, God gets more and more glory. That's what happens. Every day, I look more and more like Jesus more and more often, and God gets more and more glory. This is the salvation of the souls that he is talking about. That as we become more and more like Jesus more and more often, more and more people see that reflection of Christ within us and they are drawn into salvation. That we are growing to be better disciples and as a result, we are making more disciples. I hope that sounds familiar. But in the Western and American version of the church, we have often been led that God's will for our life and your, for your life and for mine is that everything be happy all of the time. That God's aim is to provide me with prosperity and to make and keep me happy, wealthy, and wise. Therefore, following this logic, if I ever find myself in a trial or a time of testing, I just must be in the wrong place. Trials are to be escaped. Trials are bad things. Trials are an evidence that I don't have enough faith or that I must be sinning. Just something to think about. I'm gonna quote another pastor who doesn't work at this church. I want you to hear these words in light of what, first Peter, just told, or what Peter just told us in 1 Peter chapter one. The quote is this. It's God's will for you to live in prosperity instead of poverty. Now, if this were true, that would mean that poverty is the result of being outside of God's will. But that cannot possibly be true based on what Peter just said. It also can't possibly be true based on what we observe in the world. Currently, about a billion people on the planet live on less than $1 a day. So for the statement that God's will is that we live in prosperity and not in poverty would have to mean that, that among those one billion people, there are no faithful Christians. There are no suffering saints. There are no one proclaiming the gospel. That all of those people who are in poverty must be in poverty because they are outside of God's will and therefore sinning. Also, this idea rejects 1 Peter 1, 6, when Peter says, Though now for a little while, if necessary, you are grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the exact opposite, but it's subtle and we get lulled into it. But the reality, the reality of the situation in light of what Peter has just said is that maybe poverty 
Is the trial that brings about the refined faith worth more than gold? Maybe that's the struggle because they come in various shapes and sizes. See, a prosperity teaching leaves us believing that trials are a bad thing. But according to 1 Peter, trials, they're good for us. They're good for us. It seems, maybe you'll agree with this, that it is becoming increasingly more difficult in our country to be a follower of Jesus. And many faithful followers of Jesus are praying diligently that God will do something amazing and make his name great again and that he will bring revival to this land. But listen, what if he already is? What if he already is? What if the trials that we face are actually being used by God to refine his church and refine the faith of believers so that a greater picture of his goodness could be seen and a clearer understanding of the gospel will be received and a message more potent than God wants you to live in prosperity may be proclaimed? What if he is at work in our country? And that good will come, not comfort, not convenience, not control, not popularity, not ease, but real good. That through these trials, culturally, we might become more and more like Jesus more often and more people might come to follow him as a result. Maybe instead of me praying that God fix America, I need to pray for something more meaningful that God let it get it as bad as it needs to get so that others would know and follow Jesus. Let it get as challenging as it needs to be for me that the impurity of my faith may be seen and dealt with. I'm not being cruel, I'm not being unpatriotic. I love my country. I'm just, I'm looking at the rope and, and praying that God fix everything in our country just seems short-sighted to me but that, he would, that, that I would pray that God would use the time that I have here to affect the rest of the time for everyone else. Amen. All trials, Peter says, big, small, are necessary and therefore meaningful. They will only last for a little while and they are good for us. They help us to become more like Jesus more and more often. And as a result, his name, his name is made great. As he is lifted up, right? The promise is that he draws people to himself. As we close, I wanna share with you 1 Peter 2, 23. We're gonna get to this later, but it's applicable here. Listen to what Peter says in the next chapter. Speaking of Jesus in his time of trial, he did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threatened revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. Jesus himself did not try to escape his trials. He trusted God to see him through them. I'm going to invite our worship team to return as they prepare to lead us in response. And I want to invite the rest of us to move into a time of reflection and prayer if you would just bow your heads and in the stillness of this moment, just reflect on the words that First Peter gives us this morning. We'll read one more time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Heavenly Father, we want a strong, enduring, and refined faith. A faith that serves as a testimony to your great name. We want to be more and more like your son Jesus more and more often. We want others to see our faith and to come to know you through our witness. But Lord, we confess now 
that often we have wanted other things more. We confess that sometimes we just want comfort. Sometimes we just want our way. Sometimes we just want things to be easy. For this, Lord, we repent, we confess. We know that you have called us to so much more. We ask for your grace. We remember your forgiveness through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for our sin. We pray for strength in the trial. We pray for courage in the trial. We pray for the peace that only you can provide in the trial. We know that the trials are meaningful. We know that they will only last for a little while. Help us to remember eternity as we walk through them. Please, Lord, bring your good through the trials set before us. Right now in this moment, as we're still praying, if you would say, like you're in this room and you would say, I am facing a trial right now. And I would just really like some prayer. I would love to pray for you. I'm gonna pray for you right now. If you are facing a trial and you would like some prayer, just lift your hand up up and back down. Several hands have gone up. If you're in this room and maybe you're not facing a trial right now, or maybe you are, but you're willing to join in this prayer, would you just say, I'm praying too? Come on, church family, encourage them. Say, I'm praying too. God, we come to you on behalf of those among us who are facing a trial. They've asked us to pray that you would work through their struggle to make them more like you and to make your name great. We lift them up to you. We love them. We know you love them more than we ever could. We thank you for them and for the work that you are doing in them through this trial. It's in Jesus' name that all God's people said, amen.